What do you think the poor dear old bear has been and done this time? Nothing as bad as letting off all the lights. Only fell from top to bottom of the main stairs on Thursday. We were beginning to get the first lot of parcels down out of the storerooms into the hall. Polar Bear would insist on taking an enormous pile on his head as well as lots in his arms. Bang, rumble, clatter, crash, awful moanings and growlings. I ran out onto the landing and saw he'd fallen from top to bottom onto his nose, leaving a trail of balls, bundles, parcels and things all the way down, and he'd fallen on top of some and smashed them. I hope you got none of these by accident. I've drawn you a picture of it all. Polar Bear was rather grumpy at my drawing it. He says my Christmas pictures always make fun of him, and that one year he will send one drawn by himself of me being idiotic. But of course I never am, and he can't draw well enough. When he'd picked himself up, he ran out of doors and wouldn't help clear up, because I sat on the stairs and laughed as soon as I found out there was not much damage done. It was one of the saddest hours in their lives. The great chimney rose up before them, and as they drew near the old village across the water, through rows of new mean houses along each side of the road, they saw the new mill in all its frowning and dirty ugliness a great brick building straddling the stream, which it fouled with a steaming and stinking outflow. All along the Bywater Road, every tree had been felled. As they crossed the bridge and looked up the hill, they gasped. Even Sam's vision in the mirror had not prepared him for what they saw. The old grange on the west side had been knocked down and its place taken by rows of tarred sheds. All the chestnuts were gone. The banks and hedgerows were broken. Great wagons were standing in disorder in a field beaten bare of grass. Bagshot Row was a yawning sand and gravel quarry. Bag End up beyond could not be seen for a clutter of large huts. They've cut it down, cried Sam. They've cut down the party tree. He pointed to where the tree had stood, under which Bilbo had made his farewell speech. It was lying lopped and dead in the field. As if this was the last straw, Sam burst into tears. In 1968, the Tolkien's moved from Oxford to Bournemouth, a place much loved by Edith, and where they lived for three years before she died. Tolkien returned to Oxford when Merton College offered him rooms in a neighbouring street, close both to the college and its gardens, whose beauty and serenity he had always enjoyed. But on his mind was the Silmarillion, the book all Tolkien readers were waiting for, but which he was finding impossible to finish. In the last photograph taken of him, he is standing by one of his favourite trees, the Great Black Pine, in Oxford's Botanic Gardens. Less than a month later, on September the 2nd, 1973, J.R.R. Tolkien died, aged 81, and was buried with Edith in Wolvercote Cemetery. Christopher Tolkien brought the Silmarillion into publishable form after his father's death, and like the previous books, it became a bestseller. Interest in Tolkien's writing is as flourishing today as ever, with each new generation discovering the delights of his created world.